It began with a book announcement and ended less than 44 hours later with the demise of a publishing company. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to SFF 180. Thomas here, your host as always. Very glad to be back. Thank you all for joining me. April Fool's Day is probably the most annoying day of any given year. People are expected to play stupid pranks or crack dumb childish jokes because apparently it's the one day you might be able to get away with it. So it's understandable that a number of people initially wondered if the situation that arose over this past April Fool's weekend involving Silver Shamrock Publishing was nothing more than a deeply tasteless joke that got out of hand. As it soon became clear, it was no joke. And the whole bizarre, sordid tale makes for one of the most fascinating and spectacular displays of self-immolation the world of publishing has seen recently. Silver Shamrock Publishing was an independent horror imprint based in Michigan, who derived their name from the movie Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. They first rose to prominence with Todd Kiesling's novel Devil's Creek in 2020, which became a Bram Stoker Award finalist. Since then, they've been prolifically publishing novels, novellas, and anthologies. And you've seen many of their books right here on this channel, showcased on Mailbag Monday. I was always a booster for this company. They presented themselves as the kind of scrappy little independent eager to provide a home for the kinds of writers who'd have a hard time fitting in at most of the major traditional publishers. But they weren't without some controversies. Last year, owner Kenneth McKinley made some ill-advised remarks on Twitter regarding the topic of content warnings in books, which he likened to some kind of fascistic incursion upon the free speech of writers. Okay, now certainly any kind of industry-imposed content warnings on books, like movie ratings, would be a bad thing, but no serious people advocate for anything like that. Most people simply think of content warnings as something an author can put on their own books voluntarily, as a courtesy to readers who might find them helpful. And if authors don't use them, then you can always read reviews, because reviewers can usually be counted on to tell you if a book contains any material readers might find upsetting. I mean, it's part of what we do. But McKinley trotted out all these dramatic canards about censorship and how there was an enemy within, attempting to destroy the utopia. He really used that word horror fans had built for themselves, and that Silver Shamrock was the horror field's white knight, protecting writers from freedom-hating tar babies who had snuck in the back door. Contrary to what he was expecting, Silver Shamrock's vow to be the defender of all horror writers was not at all well received by writers themselves, who saw gatekeeping where he believed he was expressing unity. It was all very ominous us-versus-them language, not the kind of thing someone would say if they were interested in supporting a community. Much more the rhetoric you'd hear from the likes of Gamergate, are the sort of extremist wackos who hang Gadsden flags off the back of their pickups, designed to give the impression that jackbooted barbarians were at the gates of horror publishing instead of just regular people. You know, basically saying, uh, hey, if somebody gets violently raped in this book, I'd really appreciate knowing that ahead of time. Okay? Thanks. Bye. Sorry, hon, I guess that makes you the enemy of freedom. So, Silver Shamrock had already raised some red flags about the persona they were building for themselves in the business. McKinley beat a strategic retreat, and the imprint continued to acquire and release books. And then, in a tweet, timestamped 7.07 p.m. on March 31st, 2022, Silver Shamrock revealed the cover to an upcoming book titled The White Plague Chronicles, and the promotional copy set off a WTF quake that broke the Richter scale. Here it is in its entirety. Time is running out. 
an unknown terrorist organization has their hands on a previously unidentified virus that is far deadlier than Ebola, and even more sinister as this horrific disease is genetically targeted to kill only the members of the Caucasian race. Two retired Black Ops specialists named Ryan O'Toole and Joey Hotsko are... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these guys are thrust into the position of being humanity's last hope. These aging combat vets have been recruited into a secret international organization known only as the Association. Their mission, to do whatever it takes to stop the virus from being released. Together, they must travel from the backwater rivers and jungles of Borneo to the scorching desert outback of Tasmania to the politically and religiously charged hotbed on the streets and back alleys of Israel. But will they succeed in stopping the madmen responsible for this atrocity before it is too late? Sadly, the answer will be no. Oh, okay. Well... Uh, maybe this association should have trusted the fate of white people to more than just two old men with Viagra porn star names. The plague will be released, and the effects of the deadly virus will be even worse than feared, mutating and evolving into a worst-case scenario. Worst case. I think you mean worst case with a T. Worst case scenario that will change the world as we know it forever. Economies will fail. Governments will fall. Countries will crumble. Billions of innocent men, women, and children will die. And a new world order <laughs> will rise in what will ultimately become known as the Collapse. Prepare yourself for a journey into the heart of darkness and beyond. Okay. So, we can get the bad science out of the way first, right? This whole idea of genetically engineering a virus to kill only white people is total bullshit. Because there is no genetic marker for race that a virus could target. There is not, inside your body, whoever you are, a specific gene that says you are a white person, or a black person, or what have you, okay? The Human Genome Project put paid to all of that, all right? These notions of racial purity are pure eugenic pseudoscience. Straight up. I mean, look, say someone is the child of one black parent and one white parent with a grandparent who was East Asian. What does this super virus do to them? Just give them a bad migraine? So, no. Unlike this book, a virus cannot be racist. And let's also talk about the geography fail. Okay, gotta love the bit about the scorching heat of the Tasmanian desert outback. I'm sorry, the Tasmanian what? Uh-huh, yeah, I, I think you mean that other island. The big one just slightly north of Tasmania? Yeah, yeah, that's where you'll find an outback. Unlike Tasmania, where they have rivers and mountains and rainforests. Hello, research? Yeah, but... Beyond just plain bad storytelling, what everyone immediately noticed about this promo copy is that the plot being described could best be summed up as White Replacement the Novel. For those of you lucky enough not to know about this shit, I'm going to have to destroy your innocence. White Replacement Theory, also known as White Genocide, is a white supremacist conspiracy theory, alleging that there is a devilish plot afoot to eradicate white people probably spearheaded by, you know, all those shifty Jews, by any means necessary, such as intermarriage, abortion, violence, any number of other kinds of forced assimilation. It was popularized in the 90s by a neo-Nazi named David Lane, but its roots go all the way to the work of American eugenicists in the early 20th century, whose efforts influenced the racial purity ideologies of Nazi Germany. Propaganda like this sounds absolutely batshit, until you realize that it possesses a tangible physical threat by constructing a victim narrative that racists can glom onto. Okay, basically, if you're a bad person 
who wants to victimize people who don't look like you, you have to first create an alternate reality in which they victimized you first. Any harm you then cause is fully justified as defending and preserving your racial identity and heritage. Mass murderers like the ones in Christchurch, New Zealand and El Paso, Texas, openly discussed white replacement in their manifestos, and the racists who marched in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017 also chanted about white replacement. And yes, these ridiculous views are held by the very same people who hate things like LGBT rights because, and I am quoting actual people I used to argue with on Facebook, identity politics are stupid. Yeah, bigotry does not exactly walk hand in hand with intellectual rigor, let alone honesty. So, yes, this is a book premised on white supremacist propaganda that inspired mass shooters. Some person or persons unknown, but definitely nasty foreigners and not good red-blooded Americans, based on how our two bumbling heroes travel the globe through non-existent deserts looking for clues, have decided to power level their white genocide plans with a massive pandemic, the result of which apparently is that human civilization comes to an end, because you can't have that kind of thing without white people. Really, throw in some Dianetics? And you'd have a story John W. Campbell would have lost his mind over. Now, this is not the first time speculative fiction has had embarrassing examples of race fail. <laughs> Far from it. Uh, just off the top of my head, I can think of a few examples. Probably the one most of you are likely to be aware of is a self-published dystopian YA novel from about ten years ago called Save the Pearls Revealing Eden. A book so mind-bogglingly wrong-headed that it even attracted the wrath of N.K. Jemisin. But I think there's a distinct difference between that book and this, because while Save the Pearls was the product of an overly earnest, misguided white woman who naively thought she was producing a powerful anti-racist statement, The White Plague Chronicles is written by a man named Gene O'Neill, who seems to understand full well what he's all about. And his book is a product of our post-Trump times, where education itself is being threatened by ideological book bans under the pretext of protecting students against critical race theory. Remember how it works? First, construct a narrative in which you are the ones being threatened and victimized, and use that as justification for your own oppressive activities. Now, since defenders of this kind of thing will always misrepresent what the criticisms are about, let me be clear. Nothing about anyone's rights is an issue here. Gene O'Neill has every right to produce a book like this. He has every right to seek a publisher for it. Silver Shamrock had the right to choose to be that publisher and sign the author to a contract. Every right in the world. But if you're someone who wants to present your writings to the world in published form, then everyone out there who sees your work, or even just the promotional materials for that work, has an equal right to both form and then voice an opinion of it. Publish something most people consider morally reprehensible, and prepare to hear them call it that. And that's all that happened. Readers encountered a book whose entire premise they found disgusting, because it was disgusting. Other writers, published by Silver Shamrock, decided in droves that they had no wish to be associated with this book or any publisher who would release such a book, withdrawing their own books. Less than two days after the cover reveal for The White Plague Chronicles, Silver Shamrock simply seized operations, deleting their Twitter account, shutting down their website, releasing all current authors from their contracts, and just ceasing to exist. No statement, no public acknowledgement or apology for pissing in the pool. Just poof, gone. And that is, yes, pretty cowardly. But the more I think on it for the author, this is probably gold. I think he probably got exactly what he was after, even if Silver Shamrock had to get crunched under the bus to do it. While the storm was raging Saturday afternoon on Twitter, some of O'Neill's friends and colleagues were defending him passionately as a nice and generous man, without a racist bone in his body. 
But here's the funny thing. Look, I live in East Texas, okay? And I can tell you, the most repellent racists I've ever met were always extremely nice. To me. I don't doubt any of the writers who offered themselves up as character witnesses for Gene O'Neill, who was described in Silver Shamrock's promotional copy as a legendary writer. But this is a guy who, two years ago, published a novel called Lost Tribe, all about the discovery of an ancient Caucasian tribe of Native Americans. So, you know, yeah, white people were here first, right? <laughs> all that. So yeah, this is a fellow whose attitudes towards race are, at best, sketchy. And here's what I meant by the new book being a product of the times. To a certain political mindset, nothing is a bigger feather in their cap than to be able to paint themselves as a victim of cancel culture and the woke mob. I don't believe for a moment that this author is an idiot. He absolutely knew what kind of reaction his book was likely to get. But in his position, why care? He knows the kinds of people who beat their chests over wokeness will leap to his defense. And in fact, that was already happening very soon after the initial controversy erupted. It doesn't matter that it's dishonest. All that matters is that it works. Look, whatever happened to Silver Shamrock, Gene O'Neill can come out of it not only unaffected, but a hero to the only people he cares to impress. He can self-publish his book, riding the shitstorm it stirred up as a publicity coup. Read the book that made the woke snowflakes so mad that they destroyed an entire publishing company to suppress it. But of course, Silver Shamrock died of self-inflicted wounds. No one was demanding they shut their doors as a company over this book. And even if just one person had, it would only be somebody's angry tweet. Not like it has any power of legal compulsion. No one can force a publisher to close down. Look, I promise you, I have reviewed a few books equally as racist as this one. And even in my harshest criticism, and I can get pretty harsh, I didn't demand the author be cast into perdition. I didn't demand the publisher be burned to the ground. And you know what else? I'm also old enough to remember the picket lines in front of movie theaters playing The Last Temptation of Christ. I remember a prominent TV evangelist offering Martin Scorsese $10 million for the negative to that film so that he could burn it. So you know, all those people screaming about cancel culture haven't ever been shy about attempting some canceling of their own. So then, writers have the right to tell their stories, and the public has the right to love, hate, critique, or condemn those stories. In the end, this was all just a sad, unnecessary affair with splash damage that affected people who never even asked to be a part of it. But some good is coming out of it. Some of the orphaned Silver Shamrock writers who didn't even get the courtesy of an apology or explanation from their publisher are already being courted by other independent imprints, proving that the horror community is one of the most generous and supportive communities in all of the arts. And as for the White Plague Chronicles, well, I mean, I don't know what he's going to do, but I'll tell you. It would not surprise me if it was up on Kindle Unlimited within the month, with its author over on <laughs> Gab and Parlor pushing his martyrdom at the hands of vengeful Wokies to prospective readers. Hey, I guess that's what they call the free market, huh? <sighs> well, that's all I have time for today. Thank you all for joining me. If you're watching me for the first time, I do reviews of science fiction, fantasy, and horror here, plus additional bookish content as I see fit. And every once in a while, I'll shoot off my mouth in editorials like this one. So if you enjoyed watching, please hit that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe if you have not done so. That is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store, and I do have a Patreon, but what I've been telling people lately is, if you are in a money-donating mood, please don't send any to me at present. Instead, try to find some online aid organization that is working to help 
all of the people over in Ukraine suffering at the hands of this uh, horrible, horrible Russian invasion and the uh, atrocities that are occurring over there. It's really, really awful. So, yeah, do something for them because I'm just fine. But <laughs> if you are one of my Patreons, well, I want to say thank you all so very much for the added support. I use the Patreon money to pay off Matt Olson, my incredibly gifted channel artist who does all of my great thumbnails and other artwork for me. So thank you all again for that additional support. I want to thank all the rest of you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see all of you next time, please stay safe and healthy and happy reading.